diabetic foot wound is a devastating event. Uh, we at the wound clinic have many modalities to uh, help with the diabetic foot wound. We have uh, skin substitutes. We have uh, equipment that will uh, identify uh, small vessel disease. Uh, if someone comes in with a bounding pulse, that usually means they have vascular calcifications and not a normal blood flow. So we have patients that uh, we use what a TCOM on to discover where their small vessel disease is. And we even put patients on sometimes a nitro patch to help with the blood flow uh, so that they get more blood flow to the wound site. As uh, I'm sure everybody knows, diabetes is a disease that has led to obesity or the other way around maybe. And we're just getting fatter and fatter. I mean, I resemble that remark. So diabetic foot ulcers uh, have an annual incidence of 1% to 4%, and a diabetic will get in his lifetime a chance of getting a foot ulcer up to 25% of the people get those. And once they do, they end up with 85% of them going on to lower limb amputation. We at the wound clinic are preventing that, and we'll show you how here. This is a devastating slide. I, I, I just can't tell you enough how... Uh, patients uh, that get a diabetic foot ulcer, the mortality rate of a diabetic neuropathic foot ulcer is 45%, which is higher than prostate cancer and breast cancer combined. So this is, it's a devastating incident for a patient to get a neuropathic diabetic foot ulcer. How they get it is through a whole host of mechanisms. Not only do they get the neuropathy and they can't feel, we had a patient come in the other day, he had his reading glass. He had, a, he had a wound on his left foot, but we take both shoes off. You know, in the podiatry office, the joke is, at the primary care doctors, they're completely naked except for their shoes and socks. At my office, they're completely clothed except for their shoes and socks. So we took both shoes off. His reading glasses were in his right shoe. Oh, I wondered where that was. Yeah, that's how numb they are. So what happens is, is that with the neuropathy and the small vessel disease, patients get a change in their foot structure. These small muscles that are intrinsic to the foot lose their blood supply and their uh, neuro neuropathic supply. And then what happens is, is that they lose their function. Then what happens next after that? The metatarsal phalangeal joints become unstable the metatarsals drop, they get that plantar callus, and then that is a pre-ulcer. This is a study that confirms this last study. This was done in Norway, where they followed the whole town of people for uh, 10 years and found that the death rate in patients who are non-diabetic was 10%. Patients that had diabetes but no foot uh, ulcer had a death rate of 35%. Patients that had a diabetes with a history of a foot ulcer had a 50% mortality rate in 10 years. So it just shows you how devastating having a diabetic uh, foot ulcer is. <clears throat> what else happens with the diabetic foot ulcer is that if you don't reduce the size of it quickly, it doesn't heal. And even with good care, only 25% of the patients after 12 weeks heal. And after 20 weeks, only 30% heal. We have a little higher rate than that in the wound clinic, huh? <laughs> this statement came out in 1999, 15 years ago, where it says by the American Diabetic Association, if your diabetic foot ulcer does not reduce by 50% after four weeks, it doesn't heal. And, you know, just like smoking, we knew that, I don't know, before I was born, the Surgeon General said, smoking is bad for you. It took 50 years to disseminate that into society. Uh, here's a study that proves that if you get 50% reduction at four weeks, 58% of the patients go on to heal. If you don't, only 9% do. So four weeks, 50%. Pardon me. This is a, another study that says the same thing, that the healing of diabetic foot ulcers, first four weeks of treatment, if you don't shrink it by half, is unlikely to achieve success. 
Again, another study that confirms that same finding. How you get the patient to heal is by making the chronic wound acute. And the way to do that is by sharp debridement. This is a patient whose uh, wound, all this hyperkeratotic tissue has to be removed. You can see here where we're making the wound acute. This is a all necrotic or uh, senescent or old looking. And then once you get some granulation tissue, where you can see this right here, there's some good granulation tissue going on right here. We do a wound bed preparation where that is uh, reestablishing the wound in an acute state and we are preparing it for one of our bioengineered skin substitutes. It's good to bleed. We make these bleed. I get hollered at. You're making a mess. <clears throat> so I have a couple of cases. Uh, this first case is a patient that uh, many of us worked on. It's a young woman, 36 years old. She's on uh, dialysis. She's morbidly obese. She has a whole host of medical problems. She came into the ER with a swollen, blown out foot. It had an incision and drainage. MRI, they suspected osteomyelitis. We did a follow-up with an Indium 111 scan that showed that it was Charcot joint, which is a long-term complication to diabetic neuropathic feet. So she had a Wagner grade three ulcer. It's pretty big, six and a half centimeters by three and a half centimeters. She got an IV antibiotic. We did the surgical debridements. We had a wound vac on her. We did a wound preparation. It took us 14 weeks to heal. There's the wound on the medial side of her foot over her posterior tibial tendon over the uh, navicular bone. And you can see how it's nice and granular right here. We started putting a bioengineered skin substitute on and you can see how as time went on, we closed the wound down. She's back to work. That's one of the things about uh, diabetes and amputation, it's not just the cost associated with hospitalizations or diabetic foot care. These patients have lives. We have a patient right now who wants to dance at her granddaughter's wedding. I got one more month to go to get her healed. You know, it's, it's important. Here's our second case. This guy has the trifecta, right? He's got diabetes, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia. He had a cancer on the side of his heel that didn't, once they excised it, it didn't heal. And that's because he was a diabetic, poor wound healing. Uh, so we re to make sure that there was no cancer. We did offloading, surgical debridements, wound bed preparation, some more bioengineered skin substitutes. And this time it took 12 weeks to heal. And you can see that that, look at how big that wound is on the posterior lateral heel. Here's the insertion of the Achilles tendon right here. And then after a while, with these bioengineered skin substitutes, oops, you can see how it's starting to shrink down. Shrink down, here's with the graft on. You can do those grafts weekly. And it continues to close. There he is closed. 12 weeks. So, in conclusion, diabetic foot ulcers have a higher mortality rate than prostate cancer and breast cancer combined. They're devastating for these patients. Once they have an amputation, they're on a slippery slope. Uh, and, and if you are treating a diabetic foot ulcer that hasn't reduced in size by 50% after four weeks, it's gonna be difficult to heal. And finally, thank you for coming. Thank you for sending your patients to the wound clinic. And uh, it's always nice to partner with you folks. Thank you very much. Yeah, John. Is a bad prognosis on that uh, septic, that size reduction by 50% related to the speed of initiation of therapy or the underlying disease? Yeah, it's uh, both. If you don't get that thing to close down, the wound stays open forever, it remains a chronic wound, then it never enters the acute phase of healing and uh, it's just stuck. And then once the skin is broken and the wound is open, 
chance for bacteria to enter and travel up, you know, end up with osteomyelitis. And Hyperbaric oxygen in a diabetic foot is only indicated if the patient has osteomyelitis. So you have to have osteomyelitis first before you can qualify for hyperbaric oxygen. But it works. It, it works quite well. It, it, it creates angiogenesis uh, to help with the small vessel disease. And what else it does is also with the uh, uh, two, atmospheres, two atmospheric pressure dive, it crushes the infection. But you got to... Yeah, but one of the things about osteomyelitis, though, is if you have necrotic bone remaining, you have to excise that before you can get complete healing. So that's why we have a team approach. You know, the others, others of the clinic take care of the HBO, and I do the 